All creatures of our God and King, lift up your voice and with us sing. Alleluia, Alleluia. Thou burning sun with golden beam, thou silver moon with softer gleam, oh, praise him. Oh, praise Him. Alleluia, Alleluia, Alleluia. Thou rushing wind that art so strong, ye clouds that sail in heaven alone. Oh, praise Him. Alleluia. Praise, rejoice, ye lights of evening, find a voice. Oh, praise Him, oh, praise Him. Alleluia, alleluia, alleluia. Thou flowing water, pure and clear, Music for thy Lord to hear. Alleluia, Alleluia. Thou far so masterful and bright, that givest men both warmth and light. Oh, praise him, oh, praise him. Alleluia, Alleluia. Take your part, oh, sing ye, Alleluia. Ye who long pain and sorrow bear, praise God and on Him cast your care. Oh, praise Him, oh, praise Him, Alleluia, Alleluia. their Creator bless, and worship Him in humbleness. Oh, praise Him, Alleluia. Praise, praise the Father, praise the Son, and praise the Spirit, three in one. Oh, praise Him, oh, praise Him. Alleluia, Alleluia, Alleluia. I want to talk to you tonight about one of the great Bible themes, and that is the precious blood of Christ. I don't know what it's like nowadays in this age of man-made fibers, but I do know that many years ago, in every alpine rope, every rope used by a mountaineer or a rock climber, there was a, a red cord that ran through the length of the rope from beginning to end. And whenever the mountaineer saw that red thread, he knew that that was a tried and tested rope on which he could trust his life, on which he could depend. As I say, I don't know if that applies today. If there are any mountaineers or rock climbers here, uh, no, forget all about that in, in and around Odessa. I don't think there are too many mountaineers. But if you know anything about that, please tell me at the close of the service because I'd like to know. But that's what it used to be, the red thread that ran through the rope from beginning to end, indicating a trustworthy rope. Well, there's a red thread that runs from th through the Bible from Genesis to the Revelation, and that is the red thread of the blood. It's an amazing fact 
that you read at least 460 times about blood in your Bible. So we're talking about, first of all, about blood. Then we'll talk about the preciousness of blood. And then we'll talk about the precious blood of Christ. You find mention of the blood right at the very beginning, first of all in the actions, and then in the promises, and then in the commands of God. You find it in the patriarchal age, as God deals with, uh, with Abel, and with Abraham, and Isaac, and Jacob. And then it, it moves on into the Mosaic age, and you see the blood in the sacrifices that God commanded to be offered in the tabernacle. And finally, when you come to the New Testament, you see the blood in the ratification of the new covenant when the Lord Jesus shed his blood that the new covenant might become the means of our salvation. Let me take you first of all uh, to that early example in the book of Genesis. Genesis chapter 3 for example. No sooner has God pronounced uh, punishment upon all those involved in that original sin and made the first promise of redemption in Genesis 3.15 when he said that the seed of the woman would bruise the serpent's head that God himself provided the very first covering and that involved the shedding of blood. God provided coats of skins for Adam and Eve. As I say, that involved the shedding of blood. And that, there's something else there that, that impresses me. It suggests to me in the first place that redemption is something that has to be provided by God. Man could not provide his own covering. And I think of the words of Abraham when he was sent to Mount Moriah to offer his son Isaac as a sacrifice there. Do you remember the story? They're making their way and the, the, the boy, he must have been about 15 to 17 years of age at the time, he said, Father, there's the wood for the fire, but where is the lamb for the sacrifice? And Abraham said, God will himself provide the lamb for the sacrifice. Notice, not God will provide a sacrifice for himself. It's not talking about a sacrifice for God. It's talking about the fact that God himself would provide the lamb. And there, prophetically, you have an indication of the lamb of God, which was, who was to come later to take upon himself the sins of the world. God will himself, you must emphasize the word himself, provide the lamb for the sacrifice. Genesis 28, uh, 22, verse 8. Now, the importance of blood... And the sacredness of it, the, 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 the sanctity of it, is something seen throughout the Bible. And we're talking now about not only the blood of men, but even the blood of animals. Think about the sanctity of blood, as you find it indicated in your Bible. Let me ask you a question, though. Can you stand the sight of blood? Or do you get a little queasy, a little uneasy? Uh, do you feel faint? when you see blood shed. Now why is that? It certainly cannot be the color because red is a very common color. And you, you, you undoubtedly know already that tomato, uh, tomato, yes, tomato, 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 uh, tomato sauce, uh, tomato ketchup translated into American, is something that is used in theatrical productions and has been used for a very long time for blood. So it cannot be the color that makes you feel uneasy. Why do you feel uneasy or faint when you catch the sight of blood? I think I know why it is. I think that there is within us an inbuilt instinct that makes us aware of the sacredness and the sanctity and the preciousness of blood in the eyes of God. And the Scriptures reflect this, you know. Uh, from the very beginning, uh, it was so, and God didn't explain why it was so at the beginning. The reason for the sacredness of blood only became evident when God began to reveal His plan of redemption and the place that blood was to occupy in that plan. For example, uh, we find that we don't travel very far in the Bible before this becomes evident. Genesis chapter 4. You remember the time when Cain slew his brother Abel, killed his brother Abel? What did God say? He said, what have you done? The voice of your brother's blood cries to me from the ground. 
Have you ever stopped to think, and I, I just throw this in as a little bit extra, have you ever stopped to think how it was that Cain slew his brother? What was the method of the murder? But the Bible tells you, not in Genesis. You have to come to 1 John chapter 3, verse 12 for that. And John says that Cain, who was of the evil one, slew his brother. And wherefore did he slay him? Because his deeds were evil and his brothers were righteous. The word that is used for slew there is a word that was used always for the ceremonial slaying of animals. In other words, putting it in very simple terms, Cain cut his brother's throat. That's what the word means. Just as an animal was slain for sacrifice, so Cain slew his brother Abel in the same way. But you see, the voice of that blood spoke to God from the ground. And even later, in Second Samuel chapter 23, there was the time when David was fleeing or hiding from King Saul, and... In an unguarded moment, he said, Oh, that someone would give me a drink of the water that is in the well by the gate of Jerusalem. And without telling their, their, their leader, three of David's greatest men broke through the lines of the Philistines who occupied Bethlehem at the time, and they brought back water from David's own village, and they presented it to David. But you know, David didn't accept it. He recognized the tremendous risk these men had run to bring that water. He realized that with the jeopardy of their lives, they brought me it. That's what David said. He said, why should I drink the water? For with the jeopardy of their lives, they brought it. And he poured it out as a libation before God. That water had taken upon itself the significance of blood in his eyes. And you know... If I take that a step farther, even wicked men in Bible times recognized the sanctity and the sacredness of blood. Remember the time when Jesus had been taken into the palace of Caiaphas, the old high priest. And when Jesus is being led out again, the palace of the high priest adjoined the temple. Judas slunk out from the shadows and confronted the priests in that procession. And he said to them, I have sinned in that I have betrayed the innocent blood. Innocent blood. That's what troubled him. But he soon discovered that these men who had been willing to do business with him the night before wanted nothing more to do with him. They despised such a man, such a traitor. And they said, what is that to us? See thou to that. And Judas, in one despairing gesture, took the bag that held the thirty pieces of silver and he flung them flung it over the wall that separated the high priest's palace from the court of the temple, and the money fell with a clink and the clatter into the courtyard beyond. And do you know, in the midst of one of the greatest travesties of justice the world has ever seen, these men halted that procession, and they went around to the court of the temple, and they gathered up the money, and they held a solemn meeting to decide what to do with it. They couldn't put it back into the treasury whence it came, because they said, it is blood money. It is the price of blood. And so they decided, well, the potter's field has been worked out. There's no more clay there. It is empty. We will buy it. We'll use it as a burial ground for strangers. And they called it the potter's field to bury strangers in. But the local people knew what it was. The local people called it Akeldama, which in the Aramaic means the field of blood. And that was the name that stuck to this very day, the Scriptures say. But you see, even the priest did not want to have anything to do with that money which was the price of blood. Now because God regarded blood so sacred, again, we find that very early in history, He imposed both social and religious restrictions on the use of blood. Think, for example, of the significance of animal blood. The importance of animal blood in the social practices of that time. Look at what God's Word says about the sacredness of the blood of animals. In Genesis chapter 9, for example, if you read verses 3 and 6, you discover that uh, immediately after the flood, God made a covenant with Noah. And God said to Noah, 
everything that lives shall be food for you or meat for you. In other words, they were not to be vegetarians any longer. He says, everything that lives or moves shall be food for you, even as I gave you the green herb for meat. Now, up to that particular point, up to the time of the flood, they evidently ate vegetables and fruit. But after the flood, God gave permission for men to eat flesh, but with one prohibition. God said, only the flesh with the life thereof, that is the blood, you shall not eat. And the sanctity of even animal blood uh, was such that even when animals were slaughtered for food in Old Testament times, uh, it virtually became a religious action. Uh, for example, in Deuteronomy chapter 12, uh, this command is emphasized. God gave them permission to eat as much flesh as they desired, it says, uh, but they mustn't use the blood. It shall be poured out upon the earth like water. And twelve times in the Old Testament that command rings out. The blood was not to be used for food in any way. It was to be allowed to flow out upon the earth like water. Now Leviticus 7 repeats that. God says, You shall eat no blood whatever whether of fowl or of animals, in any of your dwellings. Now listen, whoever eats any blood, that person shall be cut off from his people. Now, in your dwellings simply means uh, as a food, not to be used as food. That is the social, that is the domestic prohibition that God placed upon blood because of its sanctity. And you know the people generally observe that. There's one outstanding incident in uh, the book of Samuel, the first book, chapter 14, and I think it's recorded because it was the exception. There has been a battle. King Saul has won. Jonathan has won. And so famished are the soldiers of Israel that they take the spoil of battle, the animals they've captured from the Philistines, and they slay them, and they eat the flesh with the blood. And... Well, this was such an appalling act that somebody ran and told King Saul what the people were doing. And Saul hurried to them and said, You have sinned in eating with the blood. And he commanded a stone to be brought forward, and any other animal they needed for food was slain on the stone, and the blood was allowed to run out before God as a libation. So then there came the religious prohibition. In Leviticus 17 and verse 11, we're told that anyone who disobeyed this command with regards to blood, whether that, strain, whether that was an Israelite or a stranger living among them, that is to say, a, a, a non-Hebrew who had attached himself to them, well, that such a person would incur God's anger. And God said, he shall be cut off, he shall be disfellowshipped from among the people. He shall have no part in the covenant that God made with the nation at Sinai. Now notice, God first of all instilled into the people a sense of the sanctity and sacredness of blood, and then he began to explain why it was so. God said to Noah, for the life is in the blood. In Leviticus 17, he adds to that, it is the blood that makes atonement for your souls. Now that's just a hint of the great plan of redemption that God would gradually reveal in successive ages. It is the blood that makes atonement. Now that word atonement is an interesting word. In the Hebrew word is the word kafar or kippurim. And literally it means to cover up. Literally, kippur means an averting of the eyes, a turning away of one's eyes so that one doesn't see. And it's interesting to notice this because that emphasizes the difference between the word atonement in the Old Testament and what we experience in the New Testament. When we come to the New Testament, to the Greek word, it is the word katalagi. And it literally means a redemption, a reconciliation, an at one -ment. Now please understand what I'm saying here. 
In the Old Testament times, there was no such atonement as you and I experienced because of the preciousness of the blood of Jesus. In Old Testament times, sins were never forgiven. They were never taken away. They were simply covered up on the great day of atonement. Every year when the high priest went into the Holy of Holies and before the Ark of the Covenant interceded with God on behalf of the people, there was no atonement, there was no forgiveness mediated there. Sins were simply covered up. The writer of the letter to the Hebrews tells you that. He says there was a remembrance of sin every year. All that happened was that when that sacrifice was offered in the Holy of Holies, God accepted that sacrifice as a confession of guilt on behalf of the priest, the high priest, first of all for himself and for his family, and then for the nation, and sins were rolled forward for another year, waiting for the time when God's own Lamb would come and take away not simply the sins of the Jewish people, but the sins of all mankind when he will become the Lamb of God, taking away the sin of the world. And you know, when you think, for example, of the Passover, uh, you, you see how this worked out. You remember on that great day, when God determined to deliver his people from the land of Egypt, each family was to slay a lamb, and they were to, were to prepare a special meal, they were to eat that meal, ready for a journey, and the blood of the animal, the blood of the sacrifice, had to be taken and put on the doorpost and the crossbeam of their homes on the outside where it could be seen. And God said, when I see the blood, I will pass over. The blood provided an atonement. The blood provided an averting of the eyes. The blood provided a covering. And by the way, very often we make a mistake when we talk about that great Passover event. We talk about the angel of death passing over Egypt. The angel of death did not pass over Egypt. God passed over Egypt. The Lord passed over Egypt. He said, when I see the blood, I will pass over. Now what about the blood in the New Testament? Well, you read about that in Acts 15. Of course, we recognize we're not under the law of Moses. We don't have to observe the rites and ceremonies of the law. We're beyond that today. But nevertheless, you must understand that this command concerning the sacredness of blood predated the law of Moses, as I've already shown. It goes back to the time of Noah. And then it was incorporated into the Mosaic covenant, into the Mosaic law. When you come to the New Testament, we find in Acts chapter 15 that there were certain Jewish Christians so involved with the old law that they couldn't see the way in which a non-Jew could become a Christian unless he first observed the law of Moses. They said, in effect, look, you can't start the race halfway through, or you, you shouldn't begin the book uh, near the end and read the final chapter. You have to begin the book at the beginning. You have to start the race at the beginning. And if you want to be saved by the new covenant, by the blood of Jesus, you have to go to the very beginning, and you have to submit, first of all, to the law of Moses and all the ceremonies of the law of Moses, particularly involving the rite of circumcision. And so there was the meeting held in Jerusalem, as described in Acts 15, when Paul and Barnabas and others came together to discuss with the apostles and elders the relationship of Gentile Christians to the law of Moses. And you know the outcome, don't you? It was decided that the Gentiles didn't have to keep the law of Moses, which had been nailed to the cross anyway, but there were certain practices among the Gentiles which gave offense to Jewish Christians, and consequently the Gentile Christians were asked to abstain from the pollutions of idols, that is to say, abstain from anything connected with, the, with sacrifices to idols, and from unchastity, immorality that was rampant among Gentiles in those days, and from that which is strangled, that is to say, from anything where the blood has not been shed, the blood has not been allowed to run out, and from blood. Many Gentiles 
not only ate blood, but they drank blood because they had the weird notion that either the strength or the soul of the animal passed into them when they drank its blood. Now that ruling was carried by Paul and his companions to all the Gentile churches. And in that way God made the people recognize the sanctity of blood. Now in... Think about human blood for just a minute. Again. Genesis chapter 9 verse 6. God gave a command to Moses concerning the shedding of human blood. And the command is quite specific if you want to read it for yourself. Uh, whoever sheds man's blood... Now listen, whoever sheds man's blood, by man also shall his blood be shed, because in the image of God made he him. Now, that was capital punishment in Old Testament times. I know there are some people who don't like to think about that, but that was certainly the law in Old Testament times. And furthermore, that law held good not only through the age of the patriarchs, but on into the Mosaic Age, even after the new religion had been established at Sinai, and God had given them the laws uh, uh, for the worship in the tabernacle. Because we find, for example, in Numbers 35, God says, You shall take no ransom for the life of a murderer, he shall surely be put to death. And the reason is given. For blood pollutes the land. Ye shall not pollute the land wherein ye dwell and wherein I dwell. For God says, the Lord dwells among the people of Israel. And for that reason, cities of refuge were appointed for, some, for anyone who'd uh, killed somebody accidentally. Now we're not talking about, we're talking about manslaughter here. And the law said that if somebody accidentally was guilty of killing his fellow man, he must flee to one of six cities which God had arranged uh, to be prepared, three on either side of the river Jordan, within easy access, in other words. And along the road there were signs that had the Hebrew word miklot, miklot. And the word meant sanctuary so that the fugitive could flee to one of the cities of refuge and have his case heard and remain in safety from the avenger of blood. There were vendettas in those days. And if you killed somebody, then the relatives believed it was their duty to, to kill either you or somebody belonging to you. And so one guilty of manslaughter would go to one of these cities of refuge and so long as he remained there during the lifetime of the reigning high priest, he was safe. But if he stepped outside of the city, he became prey to the avenger of blood. He could be killed. After the high priest, di after the high priest died or was replaced, he was free to leave the city and live a normal life. In that way, God taught the sanctity of human blood. That human blood should not be shed recklessly. So we've talked about animal blood. We've talked about human blood. Let's take this a step higher. What about the blood of Christ? Well, if it's true that animal blood and human blood are both sacred to God, how much more precious is that blood to Him? Well, Peter talks about this, doesn't he, in his uh, first letter. He says, we're not redeemed with corruptible things, such as silver or gold. And incidentally, such as silver or gold is in the Greek in the diminutive. We are not redeemed with corruptible things, such as small or little silver and gold coins, but with precious blood, as of a lamb without spot and blemish. So here we have the sacredness and the sanctity and the preciousness of the blood of the Lord Jesus. And you know, when you go to the gospel narratives, you discover that far more is said about the shedding of his blood in his death than in some instances about vast periods of his life. Uh, we read, for example, of his blood like sweat in the garden. 
his public scourging, which involved the shedding of his blood, the pressing on of the crown of fierce thorns that scarred his brow and caused the blood to flow down his face, his nailing to the cross, the thrusting in of the spear into his side, all of these, you see, involving the shedding of his blood. And they emphasize that the shedding of the blood of Jesus was not an incident in his death. It was the purpose of his death. He came to shed his blood. And in the same way, when you turn to the epistles, the same truth is emphasized. More is said about the blood of Christ than about anything else connected with his death. More is said about the blood, certainly, than about the cross. I know that people wear crosses nowadays as a religious symbol. The early Christians did not. Uh, if, if you want a symbol used by the early Christian, uh, or the early Christian, it is the fish symbol, ichthos. For example, in the, the, in, in the first century, when a Christian met with people who were complete strangers to him, and he didn't know whether it was safe to reveal the fact that he was a Christian, he might pick up a stick from the, from the ground, and with that stick in the, dr in the dust, he would do the shape of a, a fish. So, and that was the sign, that was the indication, that was the Christian symbol in the, in the first few centuries. Not the cross, which was a, a Catholic symbol that came later on, but the fish, which indicated that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and the Savior of mankind. It, it's, it's based upon the initials in ichthos. So, so not a great deal is said about the, the symbol of the cross itself, but all about the blood. And you find, for example, that the blood was the the shedding of the blood was the main purpose of that crucifixion. Uh, the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. And you know that of the 98 times that blood is mentioned in the New Testament, 37 refer to the blood of Christ. Romans 3 verse 25 Christ is set forth as a propitiation through faith in his blood. And we are justified in his blood. I like the words propitiation, and I like the word justified. Propitiation is the word hilasmos, and it means the appeasement, the satisfaction of a debt. And the word uh, justified is the word dikaiosune, and it means to declare and to treat as righteous. It's a legal expression. When you are justified in the eyes of God, God declares you to be righteous, and he treats you as righteous. In Colossians 1 verse 20, for example, we're told that he made peace by the blood of his cross. Uh, 1 Corinthians 10 and 16, uh, the Lord's Supper itself is a fellowship, a communion, a sharing in the blood of Christ. Hebrews 13 and 12, we are sanctified by the blood, and it is the blood of the everlasting covenant. Oh, I could go on giving you so many passages that I've jotted down here in my notes. Revelation 1 verse 5, He loved us and loosed us of our sins in His own blood. And in Revelation 7 and 14, the redeemed are those who have washed their garments white in the blood of the Lamb. It's not surprising then, is it, that Peter should say we are not redeemed with things that corrupt and that rot and that don't really matter, like little bits of gold and silver, but with blood that is precious. Blood as of a lamb without spot and blemish, the blood of the Lord Jesus. So what is the significance of the blood? Well, there are words that spring instantly to mind. Redemption, justification, peace with God, access to God, atonement or reconciliation. And that's all at the beginning. Think of the redemptive power of the blood of Christ. In redemption, in Him, we have redemption through His blood. That locates where redemption is to be found. In Him, Redemption is experienced, and anyone not in him is not redeemed by the blood. If, for example, I, uh, on a cold day like this, I decide I need to go and buy a coat, say from, well, Dunlap's or some other place, Dillard's, I know these two places, you see. My wife shops sometimes. <clears throat> 
And I see, I see a coat marked, let's say it's a hundred dollars, and I've got a hundred dollars in my wallet. I hand over my hundred dollars and I take the coat and I put it on. If I'm going to get the benefit, benefit of the hundred dollars, I've got to get it in the coat. And if you're not in Christ, you don't have the benefits and the blessings of Christ. And you don't have the, the sheltering power of the blood of Christ. As a matter of fact, the word ransom, or redemption, which are two words that are used frequently in connection with the blood, are very interesting. The root meaning of the word ransom is the word luo, L-U-O, luo. And it's used in various ways. It was used, for example, of unharnessing a horse or a soldier taking off his armor, or of the setting free of a prisoner. And when it was used in connection with the setting free of a prisoner, it often meant uh, by the handing over of a ransom price. Uh, luo is the ransom, and lutron is the ransom price. You know, the, 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 the Greeks were not stupid. They had some clever ways of working with words. For example, if they wanted to, to describe an object by which a purpose was accomplished, they added the suffix tron, T-R-O-N. For example, to plow is to harrow. But the plow that did the job was called a harutron. To redeem is luo. But the way by which the redemption is procured is lutron. And the act of redemption was lutrosis. So really, when you talk about redemption, you're talking about redeeming or freeing or providing liberty by the paying of a price. And in this case, we're talking about the precious blood of Christ as the price of our redemption. In Him, we have redemption through His blood. Titus 2 and 14, He gave Himself that He might redeem us from all iniquity. And Hebrews 9 and 12, not through the blood of goats and calves, but through His own blood, Christ entered once into the holy place having obtained eternal redemption for us. Oh, there's so much we could say about this. You know, if you turn to Genesis, not Genesis, Matthew chapter 26, in the first three verses, there is an account of two meetings held almost simultaneously. The first verse says that Jesus said to his disciples, You know that after three days it is the Passover when the Son of Man must be sacrificed. While that meeting is going on, the priests are having another meeting. And the high priest is saying, Now this man must be put to death. No doubt about that. But not during the Passover, lest there be a tumult among the people. On the one hand, Jesus says, The Son of Man must die, and it's going to be during the Passover. On the other hand, the high priest says, he's got to die, but not during the Passover. Who do you think won? Well, you know who won. Jesus won. He got his wish. But here's the point. Why did Jesus choose to die during the celebration of the Passover, and why didn't he die on the Day of Atonement? Now, you'd think that the Day of Atonement was the most solemn day in the Jewish year. It was in the, on the tenth day of the seventh month. The Passover was on the fourteenth day of the first month of the year. Why did Jesus choose to die on the day of the Passover and not on the great solemn Day of Atonement? Very simply, because the Day of Atonement was an annual celebration. It dealt with all the sins committed during a particular year. It was a constantly repeated celebration. The Passover occurred only once. Jesus is going back to the time in Egypt when God passed over Egypt and re redeemed His people from the bondage and the slavery of Egypt once and for all. Jesus came and He died once. He appeared once at the end of the ages to put away sin by the sacrifice of Himself. He did what no other sacrifice could ever do. Hebrews 1 and 1 says that God 
with different times and in different ways spoke to the fathers through the prophets, has spoken to us in the last days through his Son. And he goes on to say, having by himself, by the sacrifice of himself, he purged our sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. Oh, Jesus doesn't stand daily in a temple offering sacrifices for sin. One sacrifice, one only, was adequate to cope with the sin of all mankind. Think of all the sins committed from the distant days of Adam through to the end of time, all covered by one sacrifice. Because the Word of God tells us that He offered a sacrifice for sins that were committed under the first covenant that we without them should not be made perfect. I like that. If I had a board behind me, I could draw the cross as a symbol for you. And I could show you how the, the efficacy, the power of the sacrifice of Jesus reached back to the beginning to cover sins committed under the old covenant and to forgive those sins for those who believed in God's plan. Whilst, on the other hand, it reaches forward to the end of time to cover the sins of all who will believe in Him through the preaching of the Gospel. It's a wonderful thought, isn't it? That Jesus didn't just die for the Jews. And He didn't die for people this side of Calvary. Jesus died for people on the other side who trusted in God, who had faith in God. Men like Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. And, of course, that means that the way has now been prepared for us into the very presence of God. We have confidence, says Hebrews 10 and 9, to enter by the new and living way which He has consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say, His flesh. Now this is interesting and very important. The new way into the presence of God. The word neos in Greek means new. And it means new, but of the same kind. If I had another Bible, the same edition as this, but newly bought, I'd use the word neos. New, but of the same kind. There's another word, kainos. It means new and fresh and different. These are common words in the New Testament. But there is one unique word that is used there in Hebrews 10 verse 19. And it is the Greek word prosphatos. And it means newly slain. Newly slain. We come into the presence of God by a newly slain way. Let me remind you that when the tabernacle was erected there in the wilderness... Sometimes they stayed for many years. For example, I'm sure they must have stayed for many years on the great plain before Sinai. Remember that a journey that should have taken them three months or so only from Egypt to Canaan took 40 years. So it means that for long years, long periods, they were camped somewhere. And the, the tabernacle was there. Now out in the, in, in the outer court of the tabernacle, there was the altar of, of sacrifice. And the priest would offer the sacrifice there, and they would make their way into the Holy of Holies, and the high priest would go on into the, the most holy place, I should say. They would make their way into the holy place, and then on into the, the, the most holy place, the Holy of Holies. And the blood was sprinkled seven times as they made their way into the tent. Now, I don't have to ask you to use your imagination, do I? Uh, to see that over the course of many years, uh, over many, many, many sacrifices, there would be a blood-sprinkled way from the altar of sacrifice on into the most holy place. That was the old way. But the writer of the Hebrew letter says, Jesus has opened up a new way for us, consecrated through the veil... That is to say, through His own body. Jesus, by the shedding of His blood, consecrated a newly slain way so that you and I today have access to God along the way into God's presence that is opened up for us by the shedding of the blood of Jesus. And that's a wonderful thought. 
I must go home by the blood-sprinkled way. I love that song. So Jesus brings us back to God in this way. In fact, everything about the blood of Jesus speaks of wonder. It speaks of mystery. He's been lifted up on that cross for our salvation. His blood has been shed as an atonement for our sins. And we have access to God and peace with God because Jesus shed his blood. He bore our sins in his own body on that tree. How do you reach it then? How do you come into it? Well, where was it shed? Oh, it was shed at his death. Well, isn't it logical to suggest to you that to come to the blood of Jesus, you have to come to his death? And how do you do that? Well, Paul tells you that in Romans chapter 6. He says, we are buried with Christ by baptism into death, that as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, so we should walk in newness of life. You can't go back to Jerusalem and find the place, the exact spot where Jesus was crucified. And even if you could, you wouldn't find the blood. It's no longer there. So it simply means you have to come to the blood of Jesus by faith. And God has provided a way and a means and a time whereby you, putting your trust in Jesus, uh, become identified with Him. You are buried with Him by baptism, into his death. You bury dead people, and you are buried with Jesus as dead to sin. And you rise from the waters of baptism as Jesus rose to walk with him in newness of life. It's as simple as that. Now, do you believe in the death of Jesus? Have you been buried with Jesus by baptism into death? Well, if not, the Apostle Paul says that neither have you been raised to walk in newness of life. And if you have not been raised to walk in newness of life, it means you have not been born of water and of the Spirit. You have not been born again. And Jesus himself says in John 3, verse 3, that except a man is born again, born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot see, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. And if we're honest with ourselves, we could not escape that plain, simple teaching. To be cleansed by the blood of Jesus, that precious blood, you must come to the death of Christ, and trusting in its wonderful power for the cleansing of your sin, you must be buried with him and rise with him to new life. And you know then that you're cleansed and you're forgiven. Well, if you're present tonight and you haven't availed yourself of the blood of Jesus, you need to do it. You need to submit to him in obedience and for those who believe in him, here is the, the final word. The blood of Jesus keeps on cleansing. If you walk in the light, as he's in the light, you have fellowship with him, says John, and the blood of Jesus Christ keeps, it's, on, it's in the aorist tense, it means something that is constantly going on, keeps on cleansing you from all sin. And there was a Swedish missionary who said, I'm going home on the blood. Not on my service, not on anything that I've ever done, but only on the blood. If you're subject to God's invitation tonight and you need the blood of Jesus to cleanse you of sin, we extend this invitation to you as we stand to sing the hymn that I don't know about tomorrow, I just live from day to day, I don't borrow from its sunshine, for its skies may turn to gray. Say.
And today I'll walk beside Him, for He knows what is ahead. Many things about tomorrow I don't seem to understand. But I know who holds tomorrow, and I know who holds my hand. Every step is getting brighter as the golden stairs I climb. Every burden's getting lighter, every cloud is silver line, there the sun is always shining, there no tears. touch the sky. Many things about tomorrow I don't seem to understand, but I know But the one who feeds the sparrow is the one who stands by me. And the path that be my portion may be through the flame or flood. But His presence goes before me, and I'm covered with His blood. Many things about tomorrow I don't seem to understand. But I know who holds tomorrow, and I know who holds my hand. When we walk with the Lord in the light of His Word, what a glory He sheds on our way. While we do His good will, He abides with us still, and with all who will trust and obey. Trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. Not a shadow can rise, not a cloud in the skies, but His smile quickly drives it away. 
Not a doubt nor a fear, not a sigh nor a tear, can abide while we trust and obey. Trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus, but to trust and obey. Not a burden we bear, not a sorrow we share, but our toll he doth richly repay. Not a grief nor a loss, not a frown nor a cross, but is blessed if we trust and obey. Trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus, but to trust and obey. But we never can prove the delights of His love, until all on the altar we lay, for the favor He shows, and the joy He bestows, are for those who will trust and obey. Trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus, but to trust and obey. Then in fellowship sweet we will sit at His feet, or we'll walk by His side in the way. What He says we will do, where He sins we will go. Never fear, only trust and obey. Trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey.